You'll take your hymn books and turn to hymn number 397. 397, as we stand. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. Oh, you got the wrong key. Sorry. I don't know if I can do it. God give us Christian homes, homes where the Bible is loved and taught, homes where the Master's will is sold, homes crowned with beauty thy love hath wrought. God give us Christian homes, God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes, homes where the Father is true and strong, homes that are free from the blight of wrong, homes that are joyous with love and song. God give us Christian homes, God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes, homes where the mother in queenly quest strives to show others thy way is best, homes where the Lord is an honored guest, God give us Christian homes, God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes, homes where the children are led to know Christ in his beauty who loves them so, homes where the altar fires burn and glow, God give us Christian homes, God give us Christian homes. Bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the day you've given us, the gift of life. Thank you, Lord, that we could come into your house this day to worship you. And Lord, today we honor mothers. And Lord, we see the closest kind of love apart from you that we see these in the love of mothers. Thank you, Father, that you have given us godly mothers. A godly family must have that. The nourishment of the children need that. The love of a mother constantly, even regardless how old they get, still feels the love of that mother's touch, that mother's words. Because we know, Lord, that you've instilled that just like your word of God is instilled in our hearts. We know that the words of our mothers that have taught us and, and showed us the way and directed us was a Sunday school teacher and a preacher 24-7, teaching us the things of God. Lord, we know that not all mothers are godly. So, Lord, we pray for those that did not have a godly mother. And, Lord, we pray that they've come to find the way, maybe through someone else, or maybe some way. But, Lord, we want to give you thanks this day for that. And, Lord, today we just praise you. And ask you, Lord, that these that we know that are not here, we know we have some that are sick. Lord, we lift Kay to you as she's recovering from this operation. And Lord, we know that, that your hand was through that all. 
But Lord, again, we thank you that she's in recovery. Now, Lord, we know that Joe is about to have an operation. We just ask you to be with her and, and go ahead, Lord, with everything in, in accordance to your will and your way. But Lord, today, let us just remember you're our God above all things. And without you, we would not have these godly mothers. So for that, we give you thanks through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's good to be back in the house of the Lord. And it's always a good time to celebrate, especially Mother's Day. You know, you can't help but think about how many things your mother has done for you. And let me tell you this much. God instilled that love in her heart that it would be instilled in your heart that he would be glorified through that love. Don't idolize your mother. Thank God that you have that mother or you had that mother because we know without a doubt that everything that you've been taught through the godliness, and I'm saying that not all families have a godly mother. Uh, you'll hear that in my message today. But I would just say to you that we need to just remember to give God thanks for a lot of things. And I mean, be eternally grateful if you were so fortunate to have a godly mother. But then I pray that God has led you here and God has led your heart to know who Jesus is, that if that ungodly mother is still alive, you have opportunity to share with them Jesus Christ that they may come to know the wonder that you have, and that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, today we want to honor mothers, and as usual, we just begin with this. Uh, I know that uh, the first thing we want to uh, honor is all of our 80-year-old plus. Now, I'm not going to ask them their age, but uh, if you're not ashamed, raise your hand if you're 80 and above. All right, Joe. And Miss Yvonne. All right, we still got three more. We'll have to take care of them outside of that. Uh, George, uh, give uh, give Joe Stella's this gift, and that way she can she can give that to her. Okay. And of course, we got uh, Miss Jenny and Norma. I think that gives our five that are 80 year olds. All right, the one with the most children. Uh, the one with the most children, I have no clue. Jim, you have a clue who it might be? Hard to remember. Uh, well, all I can say is this, and I mean it. When I prayed God fill up our nursery, he sent me Jessica and Brett, and boy, did they go to work. If y'all worked as hard as they did, you know what? We does have another nursery full. But then we also have another one that I had prayed, and they were already here, but uh, it was a good thing, and, and Rusty and Rose has always been a wonderful, wonderful, uh, devout mother because I know without a doubt she has taught her children well, and I thank God for her. So, Miss Rose. All right. And then our youngest mother. Well, let's see. That has to be Heather. And if you think I'm going to ask her her age, I'm not. So, what'd you say? Well, you'll have to punch him. <laughs> well, we, we're glad of that. And, 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 and we didn't applaud our 80-year-olds, but we want to do that. Too. You know, the good thing about honoring mothers and honoring them in the age, the same we'll do not long before our, uh, our Father's Day comes, but one of the greatest things is it's a shame that uh, we don't have our mothers with us. But the truth of that matter is we do. And that's why you have a memory. God give you a gift of memory. And that memory, I pray, is good memories. But he doesn't expect us to live there. He wants you to come here 
and worship the one who has given us those godly mothers. And I hope and pray you will, okay? All right, just a couple announcements. We'll go on. Continuing our Bible study and youth missions. Uh, I hope you see that in your bulletins. And then uh, you also see the ladies' prayer group on May 19th uh, at 6.30. And that means that the men is going to be going to Love's Fish Box in Kings Mountain. Uh, be here at the church by 6. And uh, I don't know if you've ever eaten up there, but it is good. I've been there. And uh, you'll certainly enjoy it. So I hope and pray that you'll be a part of that fellowship. Make time for it. You see, the problem we have so many times with fellowship, we won't make time for it. That's why so many times families don't fellowship together. It begins to fall apart because you don't make time for it. It's one of the most important things a church can have because it's the most important thing that a family has. And that family, when they fellowship together, stays together. You have to realize that the influence in a family is a lot of times made right around that dinner table. And you have to see from the youngest to the oldest. I couldn't help but one of my, uh, the members said, I don't know how Jessica does it. I said, well, if you're asking me, and the preacher's finally gonna have to say, I don't know. Uh, it's all I can do to get this old man ready, but she's got a ton of children and they're just wonderful. And I'm gonna tell you something. Jessica, you're blessed. Oh, and you already know it. And so are you, Miss Rose. But every single one of you that have children, I tell you, as your pastor, you have treasure. And I hope and pray that the blessings will continue to be upon each and every one of you. All right? Any other announcements I may have missed? Okay. Take your hymn books again and turn to number 58. 58. Love divine, all love's excelling. As we stand, please. Say. 
worship with you. Now, our Heavenly Father, take this offering for about this new letter. Keep the upper end of case back in you. For sure, man, we pray. Amen. 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 Sorry, please.
Calvary's mountain one dreadful morn while Christ my Savior weary and worn facing for sinners death on the cross that he might save them from endless loss blessed Redeemer precious Redeemer seems now I see him on Calvary's tree wounded and bleeding for sinners pleading blind and unheeding dying for me Father forgive them my Savior prayed even while his life blood flowed fast away praying for sinners while in such woe no one but jesus ever loved so blessed redeemer precious redeemer seems now i see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me, dying for Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me. Savior and friend, how can my praises ever find end? Through years unnumbered on heaven's shore, my song shall praise him forevermore. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me, dying for me. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I, uh, there it is. I was looking for my thing. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to mention today that uh, this Mother's Day message is how one mother saved a nation. And saved that nation she did because God had directed her in every manner to raise a child that would lead the children of Israel out of bondage. How many times has mama led us out of bondage? How many times have we been, maybe it's homework, so simple. Maybe it's a complication in a relationship. Whatever it may be, how many times has mama let us out of bondage and let us have this heart to be free instead of in bondage of the pressures of life. 
Jochebed. When Moses wrote about this, he didn't even mention his parents' name until just a little bit later. So in Hebrews chapter 11, and in a moment we're going to be going to Exodus, so just keep yourself at Hebrews 11, and in a moment, like I said, we'll be doing uh, Exodus because that's where the story began. Now the Bible tells us about a number of, of very special women. You know, uh, godly mothers. Hannah prayed to have a son, and God gave her Samuel, one of the great prophets of all time. And then also we see that, that Mary, Mary was called to be the mother of our Savior, our Lord and the Savior Jesus Christ. And then there was Eunice. Eunice was a godly mother, which would more or less fit the time of our day, who taught Timothy the Word of God. And I know that some of you mothers are teachers to your children. And the reason I can tell without asking is because of them and what they have to say and the interest they have in the Word of God. So when I see this, I know without asking that there's work being done at home. And by the way, church starts at home, not here. And if church doesn't start at home, I got news for you, you're not going to have church when you get here. That's why you'll never receive what you really need to have when other things are put before us. Hebrews 11 tells about a mother who was filled with faith. And we see here that her faith journey is recorded in Exodus chapter 2. Although we didn't know her name right off the go, there we learned that her name was Jochebed, which literally means the Lord is my glory. The Lord is my glory. And her husband's name was Amram. Now you have to see that, that what had happened in her life is Jochebed, her father was named Levi. We know that the, the Levites were the priests of God. So we know that Jochebed had a wonderful and I mean a wonderful saturation of what was known at that time as the Word of God. Now you have to realize back then they didn't have a Bible. They didn't know any of the things that were going to come, but they did. And they did that because they were telling it as you were the Bible. Her parents were the Bible. And sometimes we need to see that again in our houses and in our homes. When we have a house that the parents are a Bible, we're going to see a great change in the structure of that house. We're going to see a house that is not going to be blown away with the tragedies and circumstances of today. We'll find that the structure of that house is so strong that Satan himself knows he has no power to bring it down. So understand that when the parents become the Bible, which it was for Jochebed, and so she learned by listening to her parents. She learned, and it helped her to save a nation. We study her because of her faith she demonstrated in the birth of her most famous son, Moses. Now, she had other children. She had Miriam, a daughter, and Aaron, which both of them were older than Moses. But we study this because we want to see how she, a true figure, Messiah figure for the people of God, a man named Moses, was the prophet of Israel, and we know that through him that it influenced the entire nation. There are three things I want you to notice about the ministry of this mother. The first thing I want you to see is the law that she learned. Their decision is remarkable expression of faith. I mean, it is just without any doubt the decisions that she made was an absolute, and I mean an absolute, remarkable expression of what she believed. Now, Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born to you shall be cast into the river, and every daughter you shall say alive. Now, what is that actually meaning? Well, if I turn back over to Exodus, I'm going to let you know exactly what that means. It begins in Exodus chapter 1, verse 15. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shiprah, and the other was Pua. 
And he said, when ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them unto the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have ye done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively, and they are delivered ere the midwives come unto them. Now it's making it plain here that God had given them this to multiply. He was getting them ready to be a nation. And so here the Egyptian Pharaoh is afraid. He's afraid that they have grown, they actually had more population than the slaves did, than the Egyptians. Now they were afraid that they might join with the forces of another nation, the enemies of Egypt, and to overthrow the Pharaohs. So Pharaoh decided that he would do one thing. He would try to abort them. Sound familiar? Well, uh, I think we're beginning to see that today. We begin to see that God is the giver of life and the taker of life. And you have to realize that apart from murder, we call it accidents. God does not call it an accident. God calls us the preeminence of God. Everybody here has a divine appointment unless somebody takes your life. It may be an accident we call it, but we find out that it's not. It's what God had an appointment at that time. You know, we have to see here that the midwives knew that there was a greater king to fear than Pharaoh. And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come unto them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Why? Well, again, like I said, he had a great fear of the population of the Israelites. So the law that she learned here, this wasn't about population control. Pharaoh was worried that the Hebrew slaves were going to rise up and overthrow his government. And he had a right mind to think so. Why did they hide Moses and defy Pharaoh? They were not afraid of the king because they had a fear of God himself. And so we have to see here that we are in that same thing today. Roe versus Wade is led by an unseen force. The people who control the world economy wants to decrease the population because of the food that is being produced. You have to see now that we have enough food to actually feed 2 billion people. Our population is almost 8 billion. It's over 7.5 billion. We don't have a reserve anymore. So now you're going to start seeing, as you go to the stores and, and such, you're going to see they're out of them. Don't know when they'll get them. You know, I'm used to giving you the eye, eyeglass cleaner every Sunday or Wednesday. And what do I find? I go and I ask, and they said, just something as simple as eyeglass cleaner has been on back order at Sam's for five weeks, and they don't even have a clue when they'll get them. What does that mean? Well, we may say, well, that's eyeglass cleaner. I think you'll start finding it also in the food pantry that you, that you shop. You're going to find there's a lot of things that you're used to getting you took for granted and you, you bought brand names, I got news for you. Don't pass up the generics because there's no telling if you're going to get a brand name. Because we have people who hoard. That means they buy uh, for themselves more than they need, and they don't care whether anybody else gets it or not as long as they get it. Don't hoard. That's not a good thing. Understand, take what you need. And that's what God told them about the manna. Take what you need. And those that took more, it turned to worms. i got news for you. The hoarders are going to find that it will not be a healthy thing for them to continue to displease the Lord. 
So we have to see here that Roe versus Wade is led by an unseen, now understand this, an unseen people who control the world economy. We don't always think in that main, but you have to see that this is what they are. They are going to, uh, you have to see that the suspicious things about the pandemic. This pandemic was made in the lab. Well, God said that he would send a pandemic. And you may say, well, God didn't send it. God will send it through a lab or God will send it through the clouds, through the air, whatever. If God decides it's going to get, we're going to get one, we're going to get it. So you have to see here that the people that's behind it, they began to put things such as the lab and they put these diseases into the air and it begins to, they thought they could control, but got news for you. It would have been like the people of Noah's day thinking they could control the flood by building a dam when it flooded the whole world. You got to understand this pandemics and the things that are taking place is something that God has sent our way because it is appointed, he said, that before the coming of the Lord that they would be pestilence. Pestilence means diseases that become a worldwide pandemic, not something that's local and goes on, but something that affects the entire world. So as long as they can control the breadbasket of the world, they're fine. Now the Israelites uh, were able to look forward with faith to the promises of God because they could look back with faith to the word of God. They knew that Abraham had told them of things to come and the things that was going to be. And so it was passed down from generation to generation. As I said, the parent was the Bible. I couldn't help but think about my Uncle Walt as I would spend the summers up there, and he would have that Bible out there on the porch, that old chair still there, and he would sit on that, that chair and read to me the book of Ecclesiastes. And I'd ask questions, and he'd answer me. And, and the wonderful thing about it is then he would talk about Job and others. He was a, he was a Bible, holding a Bible, bringing the Bible to me. Well, was that by happenstance? Well, I'm standing here today as your pastor. Do you think it was happenstance that God was teaching me, even at that young age, sitting on a porch way up in the Smoky Mountains by a man who truly loved the Word of God? So we have to see that as we're given the Word of God, don't start looking at it in a, in a negative manner. Look at it that God is wanting to teach me that I may teach others. And that's what we do is constantly hand it down. So this is what the Israelites were looking at. They were passing it down. Romans 10, 17 said, because you can, can't have faith without the word of God. Now, Jochebed, I'm telling you, was a woman of faith. Now, how can she have faith without the word of God? Well, she can't. Again, I mentioned her dad and, and family were the Levites. And, and he, he was named Levi. And so what happens is, is she is getting all of the purity of the word of God into her heart and into her soul. And so she became, now watch, she became a Bible to her family. I know women that are like that. I know women that teach their family the word of God. And what a blessing. It's not about politics or anything else. It's about God. And what a blessing. You can feel the atmosphere of the Lord when you walk into their house. You can feel the presence of God there in every manner. Why? Because they've saturated everything in that house with the word of God, and especially the children. Now, the first thing I say is the law that she learned. But there was a revelation about moral law. They knew the story of Cain killing Abel. Because it was passed down. They knew that Abel's blood had cried out from the ground to God. The moral law of God was not created in the Ten Commandments. It was codified in the Ten Commandments. Listen to me very carefully. The Ten Commandments had not been written yet. Here's the baby Moses who will bring them down from Mount Sinai. But did you know that even before they were written, God had put it in the hearts of men. Now read your scriptures. God had already written them on the hearts of men and through that they knew that they shouldn't do this and they shouldn't do that. They had a codified Ten Commandments 
meaning before time, before it was put in stone, before that time, they already knew what those Ten Commandments consisted of because God gave it to them to live by. And that's exactly, it's called a codified Ten Commandments, meaning before it's written, it was already put on the hearts of men. You got that? Say amen. amen. Now, in other words, don't think that murdering children was okay with God merely because the story predates the Ten Commandments, but murder was wrong long before Moses, uh, long before the, the Decalogue of the Ten Commandments was brought down from Mount Sinai. Idolatry violated God's character in Genesis long before God declared through Moses, you shall have no other gods before me. They knew. They knew they were not to have another god. They knew in their hearts something just told them that, and it was written by God's hand. When God wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger on Mount Sinai, that's not the first time he used his finger. He used it in the days before Moses. He had already written into the hearts of the people that they would know what he, he required, and they knew it in their hearts what he required. You know, today we got it written in stone, and we still disobey it. Why? Because we choose not to obey. These people were very obedient. That's why God blessed them. But they also was not perfect. They fell in many ways. You see, you have to see here that adultery, I violated God's character. We have people who think adultery and fornication was not a sin until Moses brought the law down from Mount Sinai. I can tell you this much now. People today don't think it's a sin. I was playing golf a couple weeks back, maybe, I don't know. Maybe it's a week. I don't remember. I'm a senior. I get to say I don't remember. And a man was cursing. I said, George. Wasn't this George? Why are you cursing? He said, oh, those ain't curse words, Pastor. I said, yes, they are. He said, no, no. I've been told that's not curse words. I'm not going to repeat them. I said, son, this is exactly why I said you need to be in church. You're taking what somebody is telling you that's an ignorant person to the Word of God and believing it because it fits your life. It's wrong. It's a curse word. Well, needless to say, there were people saying, oh, no, that might curse words. You see, this is the ignorance of people. These are people that have been taught something wrong. The Lord said in the last days there'd be many false Christs. There'd be many false teachers. The church is warned that in the last days it must be careful of false teachers. In the days of, of, of Jesus, he, he told them, be careful of false prophets, false teachers here people who truly, truly, truly have not come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord are trying to teach the Word of God for their own glory. You have to see here, though, that lying violated God's character, but we also see, and God was not pleased with the living, with their lying lips. You see, we see that Abraham and Jacob both lied, and so we see this, and God didn't want their lying lips, he, he let them know right quick. Now let me tell you something. You say, well, Abraham lied, so I don't know the big deal, and I thought you said that all liars would go to hell. I want you to understand that when Genesis and Galatians are speaking about liars, do you practice lying? You see, you're going to fall. You're going to lie. I don't care who you are. Every single one of you out here, including me, is going to lie. You might lie because you just didn't pay no attention and you did something you shouldn't have done. I might lie by saying Jim Harris has a good golf game. That'd be a lie. <laughs> but, but in reality, what God is saying to you and me when he's talking about this, do you practice this every day? 
Do you practice fornication? Do you practice adultery? Do you practice lying? Is that a part of your everyday life? If you'll read it carefully, you see, because you're never explained by a pastor, and you should be. The Bible says in Galatians about those that's going to be cast into the lake of fire, he says, those who practice such things as lying, adultery, fornication. And if you want to know where that is in Galatians chapter 5, you can back up the pastor and see if he said something that was true. But not only revelation about moral law, we have to see that there's a national liberty also. They knew that God had prophesied through Abram that Israel would be in bondage for 400 years. Now they know they're on the backside of that right now. They know that they're about to be at the very end of it. They know that their bondage is coming to a close. And so with that happening... They made their decision in spite of circumstances and not because of them. Now listen to that. What did I just tell you? This is a gold sentence that I gave you. Because God gave it to me, I'm giving it to you. Listen to it again. I underlined it. They made their decisions in spite of the circumstances and not because of them. How many times is your decision made by the circumstances? How many times have you said, oh no, we got to do something about this. Now you're making a decision because of the circumstances. I I want you to listen very carefully. I just said they know there's on the back end of that 400 years of bondage. So they prepared before the circumstances happened. We're to learn from that. We're to bring that into our forethought. And God was pleased with this. The parents don't know exactly what to do, but they know they cannot allow their son to be killed. So they're basing their decision on what they know that God has said and not based on what the king has said. How many decisions have you made without the influence of circumstances? Think about it. Do you make decisions that prevent circumstances? These are words of wisdom. And if you put them in your mind and think of them and meditate on them, you might find yourself way ahead of the circumstances that come your way. Christian parents in America have been rolling over dead for quite a long time. The government says no formal prayer in school. The government says no Bible reading in school. The government says no Ten Commandments in school. The government says teach evolution in school. The government says homosexuals can save, serve as teachers and atheists can hold any kind of office and be uh, pastors of churches. And America rolls over and plays dead. Who have you put in the government or on the school board because you will be held accountable for your choices. Now what do I mean when I say that very word? They made their decision in spite of the circumstances and not because of them. And how many times do you plan or make a decision that prevents circumstances from happening? My mom She saved $40 to buy a piece of property. It took her two years. At that time, the bring home pay was between $2 and $4 a week. Now, I know you can't comprehend that, but I seen one of her paychecks, and it was $2.85 for 40-some hours in a cotton mill. And so Mom saved it, and she hid it behind a pitcher Now, why did she hide it? Well, my dad drank at that time, and he ran around. And so I'm not dishonoring my father by telling you that, but this was what he was at that time. Thank God he came to know Jesus Christ and, and, and Lord and Savior, and he turned from that. But she put it behind a picture frame, and it took her two years, and she got that two years 
up that $40 and she went to the man and bought the property. And then she saved another two years to buy the lumber to buy the house, to have it built. Now, how did it going to cost her? Well, it didn't cost her anything because her oldest brother, Uncle Fred, got one of his friends, Carl Hastings, and they went and they built the house for free. But was it for free? So you have to see that what has that got to do with what you just told us about planning and preventing circumstances? Well, it made sure that we were not homeless. She took care of it before we were homeless. She took care of it before we needed a house to rent to live in. That house is still standing, and I was two years old when we moved into that house. And the people that are there love the house. It was an old house, a well-built house. It was everything you wanted. The only problem was it, it was mixed up. Let me explain that. In the winter, it was cold. And in the summer, it was hot. Now, I said if we could figure out to have it hot in the winter and cold in the summer, we'd be just great. Amen? Amen. That's why I said the house was fickle. Because when you in the wintertime put your foot out on that floor, friend, don't tell me, everybody that lived back then could run. They know how to run into the living room to the coal heaters, the wood stove, the fireplace, because that's the only place the heat was. Now, it might have been different in your house, but that's where it was in mine. And in the summertime, oh, we'd pray for rain. That's the only way. That was our air conditioning. The windows were up, hoped that it would, and there'd be times when there was no wind blowing at all. I'd go get a wash rag and, and fill it full of water, and I'd turn it around and put it on my head, then spin it around and put it on my head. And then at the same time, I shared a bedroom with three brothers. And so I just want to say to you, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. So my mom made a decision that cut off circumstances before they had. Acts 7, 19 says, Stephen and the Pharaoh took advantage of their own kindred, and with evil he entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children so they might not live. You see, every midwife spared the children, but not every one of them. Not every one of them. Now listen to me very carefully. We have abortions that's taking place today, but not every doctor is an abortionist. But we must realize that in that day, some of the people were more afraid of Pharaoh than they were of God. Even though they had heard of great things God had done, but they still chose to be afraid of Pharaoh instead of God. That's why God names two of these midwives that Pharaoh says, why are you not killing them? Because we don't fear you like we fear our God. I got news for you. Did you know today that's the same thing? Did you know today you're going to make a decision on which God you're going to serve? Now the world is Pharaoh and God is God. And a lot of people that are Christians are serving Pharaoh. And you're also going to see that you're going to have to make decisions and you ask God for things and you know you're not pleasing him in any manner, so how can you go to the king that you want to and need to please, but you're not, you're pleasing another king? So you see, the decisions you make beforehand can prevent a lot of circumstances. Now I'm going to move on from that. Now she had a love that lavished. By faith, Moses, when he was born was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's command. A few loves are stronger than a mother's love and the strength of that love is manifest in the way she provided for a newborn. Along with her husband Amram, the godly mother hid Moses for three months after he was born. <coughs> You're sitting here this morning. 
And if your mother's alive, or your mother's not alive, and I know you might beg to differ because you might not have a good relationship with your mother, but you're still lavished with the love of your mother. You're lavished with it. Lavish means embedded with it. You can think of all the bad, but you must realize there's a whole lot of good that Mama did. Mama didn't abort you. Mama didn't starve you. And by the way, what a sad thing. Uh, you know, I couldn't help but see this on the news where this grandmother and mother starved a child to death. What a sad thing. You know, I was watching a video where uh, a mother was... Uh, angry with the baby because it wouldn't quit crying and, and she pulled over beside the road and took the baby in, the, in, the, in his carrier and set it out beside the road and drove off. I know they arrested her, but I don't know whether the child was harmed or what. Do you know the blessings you have to have a godly mother? A mother who lavishes you with her love? Did you know that a mother is willing to put you before her? Do you know that my mother's first new set of clothes that she had was the ones I bought her to put in the casket? Until then, she made all of hers made all of ours. Why? Well, she would do without to make sure. I don't know if you've ever walked into a cotton mill in the summertime, but all they had was little humidifiers running through there. I went into one, one Friday, and I had, to have, uh, I had to have my money for my senior reign. Uh, Sadly, when I walked in there, I looked at the temperature because I was automatically just sweating and I hadn't gotten five or ten feet inside. It was 113 degrees. I never forgot. I said, Mama, how do you stand it? She said, well, I know one of these days I'm going to retire and I'm going to get to do what I want to do. Well, she died at 64. She, she retired at 62, and then she still worked, and even then she ended up with uh, cancer of the brain, and, and she died. She didn't get to do what she wanted to do. And that was one of the things that you go back and you look at, what could you have done? Well, there's a time in my life I could have done a whole lot, but I didn't, and neither have you. And we all have that to carry. You see, her agenda, and Exodus 2 2, and the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him that he was a goodly child, he hid him, she hid him three months. You know, she would have probably been killed if Pharaoh knew about it. Not only would he have killed Moses, he would have killed the mother for this But do you know something? Again, here you see a mother. They care more for the child than for herself and would protect it in any manner. Let me ask you this. We're living in a time where motherhood has got mud all over it. And it shouldn't be that way. What a heartbreaking situation. I truly, in my prayer, I don't know if you'll remember my prayer, I don't even know if you listen to my prayer. But my prayer is not to you. I'm talking to God, and it's up to you if you want to tune in. But you heard me say to God, God, thank you for the closest thing that we have in your love on this planet is a mother's love. You know why? Because a mother will put themselves before you. And do you know what? We got a lot of mothers that's not mothers that love the same way. In the Bible it says, 
that we should treat our elderly mothers as mothers, our elderly women as mothers, and our younger women as sisters with all purity. And that's what we should do. The Bible says children are a blessing. Why do we act like they're a burden? You know, evil is increasing in these last days, and people's hearts are out of church, and evil raising the, the empty space where mercy wants to apply, apply and occupy. Now evil is there. Mercy is, is escaped the human heart. And so the Bible says that children are a blessing. I heard about a woman who was running for public office, and, and she told her husband, I think we're going to, uh, the polls look great. I think I'm going to sweep the entire state. And he handed her a broom and said, we'll start in the kitchen. Because, see, she was more politician than a wife and a mother. Sadly, this is happening. I don't want no child to interfere with the professional life that I want. I want to have all my goals met. Well, God called you to be a mother. And the mother's role is to show that her love is more for the child than for herself. And let me warn you about something else. And a mother's love should be greater for her husband than for her children. That's a blessed household. Because God says that's the way it is. Husbands, you should love your wife more than you love yourself but not more than you love God. God has everything in beautiful perspective. If we just follow it, we'd have a lot more peace in our hearts. And then she not only had her agenda, but she had her ark in verse 3. And when, and when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and dabbed it into slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags of the riverbank. Now, the Nile was infested with crocodiles. Can you just imagine that little basket in there? It's floating along, and there's crocodiles all in that river. You think that's dangerous? Say me. Well, let me tell you something else. America's got more danger in their household than the Nile had crocodiles. You turn it on the television to ungodliness. You're turning on things. You're bringing danger in to your home by allowing the children to listen to things that turn them from God. See, if you see it as a cartoon, have you took a look at it and listened to it to hear what your child is listening to? Do you know what? I did that very thing for one of my grandchildren. I said, no, 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 no. You will not listen to this no more. But Papa, I like that. And I said, well, you're not going to like it anymore because it goes against God. And you don't want to go against God, do you? Well, no, Papa, but if I can watch it, I won't be against God. No, so you can't do that. You can't do that. Are you listening to what your children are listening to? Or is it your babysitter and you really don't care? If that was a person that come in to take care of your child, you would know everything that you needed to know about them. But when you turn on that television, the greatest danger there is comes through the boob tube. And yet we do not research it. And so you see, the American culture is like a crocodile infested. She knew the point had come that she could no longer keep him, but she determined something that every mom and dad needs to determine. I can't keep my child out of the waters of the Nile, but I can keep the Nile out of my child. God gives you that much energy to do so. You see, she doesn't just have faith, she has work. She has to know without a doubt, without faith, there's no work. And there's no faith without the word of God. So here we predate Moses' commandments off Mount Sinai and see that these people had already received, and they received it in the way maybe we should have received it, written all over our hearts because we don't care to read it. We don't take time for God's word. We're blessed in every manner, and we're going to be held accountable more 
than the people of those days. Why? Because you had access to the truth and you just ignored it. That's one of the greatest blasphemies that you can do. Biblical faith is, is living, breathing, active response to what God has said. You notice in Hebrews 11, all the times the writer says by faith, and each person listed here did something because of their faith. And then perhaps she told him who he was. You know, her admonition. You know, I believe that somewhere along the line that Jacobin was just like anybody else. You know, I watched my granddaughter sometime. She'll send me a video. And she's uh, reading to Mara Rose about God. And, and it's beautiful, you know, and I just think it's wonderful. And my Rose is expecting it. And so that story has to be done. How many children do you have uh, today? It's story time. I'm getting ready to go to bed, and they got to have their story time. Perfect time to put it in there. Now, let me say this to you. Johnny Bad was telling Moses about Abraham, about Isaac, about Jacob about Joseph saving the whole nation of Egypt. And now, 400 years later, they have forgotten who Joseph is, but somehow back in the back of his mind, he remembers Mama telling him about Joseph. I don't know where it came from. I don't know why I remember it, but there was this fellow named Joseph, and God blessed him. And he saved the whole nation and, and the world from starving to death. But you see, he was living in a time now where they'd forgotten Joseph. See, just like we are, we remember the blessings of God in our trying time, and then we're just as rapidly to forget them when we should keep them fresh in our hearts. And that's one of the bad things. Let me say this to you. Wow, preacher, do you actually think that that little baby understood his mama? I understand that. If God opened his ears, he understood every bit of it Amen. or put it in reserve. I remember things my mama told me that I didn't even know I remembered until something brought them up. It's down in there. It's down in there, just like the Word of God. How many times uh, you can't quote or can't speak nothing of God but yet sometimes the pastor say something and says, I remember that. I remember reading that. I remember what that was. You see, in the same manner was with, with Moses. I heard about this guy named Joseph. His God. That's the one I want. That's the one I will serve. So you see, it doesn't go without being absolutely given over to remember. You know, the third and the last thing is the legacy that you left. I'm going to read you these verses. Verses 24 through 29 of Hebrews 11. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect to the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured to seeing him who is invisible. Now see that? Right there. He's seen God. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying, to do were drowned. Moses was not afraid of Pharaoh, just like his mother was not afraid many years later. Look at here. I want you to don't miss this. Moses was not afraid of Pharaoh when he said, look, I'm a Hebrew slave. I cannot be called Pharaoh's son anymore, Pharaoh's daughter's son anymore. No way. I'm not going to be. You say, well, was he crazy? Did he not know that Pharaoh could kill him? Listen to me. Jochebed made the same decision a long time ago. I care more about him 
and my God than I do fear his face. Now Moses is saying the same thing. Where did he get it? Well, let me tell you something. Your mother has instilled in you the very same thing that Jochebed had instilled in Moses. There's things that's in your life that your mother has taught you that you're doing and you don't even realize you're repeating what your mother's actions were for that particular circumstance. You don't have to try to remember your mother. God's word instilled in your heart a truth from your mother that your decision making would be based the same way as he guided your mother. If that ain't a blessing, I don't know. What it is. I don't know what it is. You see, if your mother was superstitious, so you. If your mother was a cursor, so you. What mamas instill in our hearts and our minds <coughs> is things that we need to get out if they're ungodly and replace them with the love that you see in the mother and call them the wife. <coughs> but I can assure you, if your mother was superstitious, so are you. If your mother was a godly woman, so are you. If not, you will be. Because you cannot kick out what God has allowed to be put in your heart. Understand that. Her son was saved. Was saved physically, but Moses was saved spiritually. There was his justification by faith. It listed four times at Moses, about Moses. This was his sanctification. He did not want to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin. Look here. We're talking about justification in our lives. You see, the first thing we have is when we get saved is justification. Justification, here it is in the Bible showing you that Moses said, I will give up all of these treasures because I want God to be my father. I want God to be my God. He was justified. You know how many Christians have come to know Jesus Christ, but they've never been justified? You know why? Because they have not turned from the sins of Egypt. They have not done like Moses, turned from them to God. They have not dispensed out of their life the sins that's in their life, they're still just the same thing. And let me say this to you. The first step in a Christian's life is justification. The second, what is it? Sanctification. Huh? Now what's the third? So if you've not been justified, you've not turned from your sinful ways. You're still living in them. You must be justified, sanctified, and glorified. You will not be glorified until you die. But you're being glorified now. So you have to see all this. He saw Christ in the Passover. He saw Christ in the serpent in the wilderness when he made it. He saw Christ in the practice of the tabernacle. God used Moses in a way that he saw the clear picture of the ultimate deliverer, Jesus Christ. He's seen him because he brought forth all these things by the instruction of God. Just as his mother was told to build that little ark, God then took Moses and he built the serpent in the wilderness. He built the tabernacle. He did all these things. Why? Because his mother taught him to be a builder. His mother was instilled in him by God. 
Do you want to be thankful today? You might be surprised. I hear people say that the husband will accuse them of being just like their mother. And you know something? Turn around and say, thank you. That's all you have to say. Thank you. Thank you that I'm like my mother. You see, his sovereign was satisfied. Love is not looking at a person's faults. Love is meeting a person's need. God showed his love because he meets our needs. Do you know something? And so did your mother. Love is not looking and saying, well, you're this and you're that and you shouldn't be. You, you know, you should be better than your brother. You should have been like this. You're too much like your dad. No, 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 no. The mother that loves says, huh, and makes it very, 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 very plain. He says it makes it very plain to you. He said God saw it was fit to enshrine his mother and husband with the pages of the Holy Scripture. You see, everything that was given, you see, that's exactly what was given there. As, as mother had instilled in her son to be a builder, to be obedient, you have to see that Moses did too. By faith he forsook evil. Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as sin him who is invisible. Love is not looking for a person's faults and throwing off on them. Love is meeting a person's need. You know, the mother may spank me, but before I close my eyes, she's giving me a kiss on the cheek. And my brother asked my mother who had got the, a bad whipping that day. And she came in and kissed him on the cheek and he said, Mama, does this mean you're sorry for beating me so bad? <laughs> you know what she said? No. The beating was necessary, but so is the love. I just received in the mail from the mountains from back in the 40s and 50s and 60s letters my mother had wrote to a friend in the mountains. Wow. And they kept those letters all those years and they mailed them to me for a keepsake. And I've been reading my mother's words to those. One of them I shared with my brother, Terry, and I couldn't have a thank you, Jessica. Mama said, oh, if I could just get a break from the children. <laughs> <laughs> just for a minute. <laughs> I said, God, please forgive me for tormenting my mom. <laughs> but what a treasure. I treasure those letters. I'll probably end up giving them to my oldest brother. But he needs to read them. But Moses saw Christ in the Passover, the serpent, and the wilderness, everything. He saw God in everything, and everything in his productive life was about about God. You know, in the end, it doesn't matter who you please if God's not pleased, and it doesn't matter who is displeased if God gives his approval. So many times, people make a, choose, a choice in their lives, but they don't care whether it, it pleases or displeases God, as long as it pleases the person who they're in accordance with. That's wrong. God must be first. And let me tell you something. We have been blessed with mothers. And I thank God for every mother and every woman. And I mean that with all my heart. Even those that didn't bear a child has a mother's heart. And I want you to realize that God knows that. 
There's not a woman born that doesn't have a mother's heart. It is what she does with that heart. Whether it develops to be the mother that God intended her to be. And I hope and pray it is with you today that we can easily say, thank you, God, for our mother. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for mothers. And today, Lord, I pray that every mother that's here and every mother's heart that's here would be blessed by the word of God. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 165. this time to come to your house and worship, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the message today, and Lord, we thank you for all the mothers. Lord, I thank you for my mother, and Lord, I just thank you for each one that has come today. Lord, may we leave today, saints, be good to be in the house of the Lord. Lord, if our mother's not here today, may we honor them with prayer, and may we honor them with our, our uh, walk with you, Lord. And Lord, there are mothers that are here. May we visit them, may we see them, and uh, may we just uh, enjoy the day with them, Lord. And Lord, we thank you and we praise you again for each one that's here. May we leave today and saying it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.